Greetings, everybody. It's so good to see you. I'm delighted to see so many of you who have joined us on Zoom. My sermon is part two of the series that we started last week entitled Requiem for Dying Dreams. And the title of part two is Exile to Exodus. And my scripture is Daniel chapter one, verses one through six, although we will draw from the entire chapter, which is, has verses 1 through 20. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to you that you've given us these different technologies to reach out to the world, to share your beautiful word. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, I had the privilege of reuniting with some of my high school classmates. Almost 60 years have passed since I last saw them. I must admit that I'm still struggling to find memory facts in my mind to match the faces to connect with this older, mostly retired men and women. As they recalled the good old days, to me, those were not days of fun in the sun while living in the cramped dorm of our boarding school. So while the others were recalling sweet memories, I was thinking in my heart and in my head that those years were like living in exile, far from my family, friends, and familiar places. Since the appearance of COVID-19, I have had days when life in America seemed a lot like those years at boarding school. The land of the free and home of the brave, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, has changed significantly despite all the technological advances that connect us instantly. It's really more like living in exile in this strange and foreign state of uncertainty, at a distance from church family and friends, without the pleasure of in-person fellowship. Even the youngest children around us know something is radically different, and a few have cried to me for the return of normalcy. But that seems impossible in this new age where we are dealing with so many disruptions and probably more unknowns than knowns, to which all of us have been and are still adjusting. Although we have seen a response of creativity and innovation like these platforms like Zoom and Facebook and all these different ones, and are doing a magnificent job of holding our part of the planet together, we've now reached the time to begin thinking of an exodus out of this virus-imposed exile. As you may know, exile is the state of being expelled, banned, or barred from one's home native country, or normal way of life, typically due to religious, political, medical, or punitive reasons. Exile can be self-imposed, initiated by God, due to disfellowship from a congregation, or enforced by a government. But however it's deployed, if the exile is created by religion, it's usually by people who love darkness more than light. Therefore, God's children of light must decide how to live and thrive in ungodly environments where we are exiled to be in the world, but not of it. We must determine to stand up for who we are in Christ, let Jesus shine through us in the midst of darkness, and work to excel in the environment in which we are exiled. However, since living in strange foreign situations is easier preached than practice, let's peruse Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, in which we can glean ways to successfully survive without losing our integrity, identity, and faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to ask Desiree Walker to read Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. I thought she did such a great job that I want her to be part of this message. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 
Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years and at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. A summary of Daniel's history reveals that God had chosen his people, the descendants of Jacob, whose name was divinely changed to Israel, to be his own. Jacob's descendants thereafter were known as the children of Israel, who were once slaves in Egypt until God made them his own and, in an extraordinary exodus, brought them out of exile to freedom in the Promised Land. It is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, saying, And what one nation on the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make a name for himself and to do a great thing for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have released for yourself from Egypt from nations and their gods. For you have established for yourself your people Israel as your own people forever, and you, O Lord, are their God. From that time, the promised land became a symbol of a strong, vibrant relationship with God, and separation from it into exile indicated the breaking of their covenant with God. From their arrival in the Promised Land, the children of Israel flourished until their prosperity peaked under King David and his son Solomon. Thereafter, the twelve tribes, plagued with wars against each other, separated into two kingdoms called Israel and Judah. On their own, the two kingdoms had their ups and downs often falling into sin and idolatry until they were divinely punished by God who allowed them to be the first taken into exile. There are three major exiles in the biblical history of ancient Israel, which, after many wars, split into two nations known as Israel, the northern kingdom of ten tribes, and Judah, the southern kingdom of two tribes, but very strong tribes. The first major exile took place in two parts in the northern kingdom. In 734 BC, the Assyrians under tiglath pileser according to 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29, and in 722 BC, when the city of Samaria was destroyed and the northern kingdom ceased to exist, these two exiles took place according to 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. While in exile, the people from the northern kingdom were dispersed throughout the Assyrian Empire and quickly lost their identity, for instead of repenting and returning to God, they immersed themselves in the prevailing cultural darkness, lost their uniqueness as God's people, and became known as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. The second major exile involved the destruction of the revered city of Jerusalem and the entire southern kingdom of Judah, by King Nebuchadnezzar 
according to Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 28 through 30. That was the most terrible of all the exiles because Solomon's temple was destroyed and the dynasty of David came to an end. The third major exile was under Roman rule in AD 70, but it's to the second exile to which I draw your attention for our lessons today because the experience of Daniel unfolded in that situation. At that time, about 557 BC, God demonstrated that he had had enough of the increased idol worship, immorality, and abuse of Sabbaths in Judah. So he allowed the Babylonians, under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, to attack Judah, and Judah was totally decimated. The marvelous city of Jerusalem and the great temple were leveled. The people were crushed, and most were taken as captives to Babylon in exile. Back then, like America, Babylon was a prosperous country. Its hanging gardens were among the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a center of learning, a hub of technology, and the epicenter of a religion with its own creation myths, temple towers called ziggurats, and worship of their king as the god among many gods. In a culture that looked to astrologers in a culture that looked to astrologers and sorcerers for wisdom and direction. Thus, like many immigrants, the exiled Jews found themselves in a strange and foreign culture, and in addition to the pain of being removed from the Promised Land, they suffered severe culture shock. Consider what it must have been like for the captives when they first arrived in Babylon. They were exiled from their country and faith community. They were exiled from their familiar work and world. They were exiled from their extended families and removed from all that was normal to them. The prophet Jeremiah had warned them of God's divine displeasure, that God was planning and preparing to punish them, but the people ignored the prophetic word. Still, as he foretold the exile, Jeremiah also explained in chapter 29, 7, that God said, Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. But many found it difficult to engage the foreign culture because of their fear of being swallowed up like the ten tribes by ungodly and evil influences during their exile. Psalm 137, written long after the exile, powerfully expresses how they faced the question, how do we live as God's people in a pagan culture? Some apparently decided to go with the flow, as many Christians today who try to fit in and not make waves even if it requires compromising their commitment to Christ. Others felt lost and angry, angry at God, angry at Babylon, and angry at themselves like many who have used the pandemic as excuse to cut ties with their local congregation. Psalm 137 verses 1 through 4 and 9 describes their bitterness, saying, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There, on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us as one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? O oh, daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Ouch! Of course, with that attitude, they were inclined to withdraw into Jewish enclaves, separate themselves from the world, claiming to abhor worldliness 
and not sing the Lord's songs of salvation to change the lives of their captors. But other exiles in the minority, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, chose to become a redemptive force in the pagan Babylonian culture and ultimately became divine instruments of salvation for the king and country. We are in a spiritual exile from our promised land where Christ has gone to prepare a place of peace and grace for us. But unlike ancient Jews, we have the benefit of the inspired writings of Daniel, which when carefully studied, provides wisdom and ways for successful survival in any exile, spiritual, physical, or both. One such outstanding way is to stand for who we are in Christ Jesus, as Daniel did with his three close companions in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Soon after the Hebrew captives arrived in Babylon, the king appointed. The king appointed is a phrase used only five other times in the entire Bible and always with Almighty God as the subject. This underscores that God, not humans, is the creator of heaven and earth with power and authority to appoint. Daniel, being a devoted servant of God and an astute student of scripture, immediately recognized that the heathen king was usurping the person and power of their God. So he recorded it here in chapter 1, so we wouldn't miss such a surreptitious move by the pagan king who appointed his choice food for their meals, which included wine and meat. And the two words, wine and meat, belong to the ritual of worship, according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 38. Daniel also figured that the king wanted them to eat from his table to indicate that he is the God who now provides their sustenance and should be worshipped. Had they eaten and drank such provisions, they would have appeared to be participating in the worship of the king. Listen to what verse 8 says. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Long, long ago, perhaps during those long months of their arduous journey from Judah, being beaten and driven by their captors, Daniel had decided that under no circumstances would he allow himself to become different in, in order that he could remain the same follower of the one true God. So he politely sought permission to have meals of vegetables and water, according to verse 12. There it is written that he said to the chief guard, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. The phrase vegetables to eat and water to drink is not a sign or affirmation that Daniel was a vegetarian. To the contrary, chapter 10 verse 3 suggests that he wasn't. But Daniel knew this phrase found only in one other place in the entire Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And he quoted it to indicate that their choice wasn't just to be vegetarians, but to choose God in the great controversy initiated by the pagan king who thought he could conquer and usurp the place of Almighty God in their life. Daniel deliberately chose that diet 
to express their choice of the original food of the true God and only creator. Thus, while the usurping king appointed Daniel and his companions resolved, decided, determined not to abandon the true God. So, my question to you is, who are you choosing today? For whomever you choose, the world or the word made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, there will be a test. Note the number 10 in this story indicating their test. When it is used in religious time, according to scripture, it's a test such as in the Jewish festivals where it is exactly a 10-day period of time between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement or Judgment. And the Day of Atonement is the test of all tests and the only time in Jewish festivals where 10 days are appointed by God. 10 days also appears in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. There, it's the number of days Jesus said the Smyrna church would be tested and persecuted, after which he will give them the victor's crown. These and many more texts underscore the function of these 10 days as time given to the people of God to prepare for the day of judgment or for the day of atonement. The test for survival of the remnant to become the brightest, according to Daniel's experience, is in relation to food, because, as an Arabic writer pointed out during the Middle Ages, you are what you eat. So, according to Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, he resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Note the word resolved. It's in the past tense, indicating he wasn't decided in the heat of the moment when the food was on the plate before him, but long, long before that, that no food, no new food would or could ever cause him to abandon his faith in the one true God. Our faithfulness to Christ is also indicated by what we choose to eat. And to be faithful to God, Daniel and his companions teaches us to choose the plain healthy food of creation, not the rich-looking, fattening fare from the table of the kings of this world. We know the motivation for Daniel to make such a decision was religious, because the language he used connotes religion and faith. It does not mean health wasn't part of it, but the essential reason is that in the great controversy between good and evil, between God and Satan, he chose God, the Creator. Therefore, if you didn't make your choice before this day, choose now whom you will serve. And when you order or make a meal, remember, what you choose shows whom you serve. Additionally, according to Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, the chief official was also ordered by the king to teach Daniel and his friends the literature and language of the Chaldeans. This was not just to ensure their smooth transition into the culture, but a cultic or worship activity intended to train them as priests who were, in those days, at the top of the system of education. The choice of young men who were blameless and perfect in language is also characteristic of priests, according to Leviticus chapters 21 and 22. Knowing all this, Daniel and his companions decided to take a great risk, both mentally and spiritually, by choosing to learn, but not to change. However, after the special diet, they did change in such a significant way in only 10 days, according to verse 12, it was recognized as a miracle, something supernatural from their God who gave them wisdom, knowledge, and skill in literature, according to verse 17. It is notable that God allowed them to learn from the literature and knowledge of the Babylonians, 
especially since their lessons included sacred writings, creation myths, astrology, and magical arts. Nowadays, there are those who insist and restrict others from reading any other Christian literature except those penned by Ellen White. But God is wise and not mistaken, for Daniel and his friends learned and knew more about Babylonian religion and culture than most Babylonians of the day, and when necessary, used that knowledge to address the king, interpret his dreams and visions, and better than their magicians and enchanters. In fact, Daniel beat them at their own game and demonstrated that those who are widely read are better, ten times better, in the hands of God to reach people in their own tongues and thoughts, so to speak. Daniel chapter 1, verse 7, reports that the chief official gave them new names, and like the word appointed, to give is always used with God as the subject. But the chief official gave them names. He named Daniel Belshazzar, Hananiah Shadrach, Mishael Meshach, and Azariah Abednego to indicate they were no longer protected by their God. You see, their original names were theophoric, meaning that the names were focused on the one true God whose presence is embedded in each name in order to both invoke and display his protection. For example, Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah, Yah, has been gracious. Mishael, who is what God is? And Azariah, Yah has helped. Their new names were also theophoric, indicating that the Babylonians knew and understood this and gave them names to change their identity and faith from their God who was overpowered, or they thought overpowered, by the pagan deities. The new names, therefore, show that the bearer was now under the protection of the heathen gods. For example, Daniel became Belshazzar, which included the name of the Babylonian god Bel. So they accepted the names, but never used them among themselves to defile them in this way. So when Daniel and his companions took their stand, they didn't do so to impress their fellow captives from Judah or interns from other nations. They did so to show that their God wasn't like the Babylonians' gods. But throughout his book, Daniel never referred to this new name for himself and showed that while the Babylonians called his companions by those names, they never used it among themselves. Friends, the world may call us all kinds of names, but like Daniel and his friends, let's stand for holiness, stand for righteousness, stand for godliness. Let's stand for Jesus Christ, whose name we bear. When we take a stand, we will make Jesus shine through us in the midst of a world consumed by darkness. Note that Daniel and his friends didn't try to force change in the eating or worship habits of Babylonians or their fellow exiles. Instead, Daniel inspired God's chosen people to live in such a way that their life and works, not just their words, were testimonies that impressed others to want to change. We also need to lovingly reach out and teach others the better way in Christ instead of being like some who say they are Christians but behave like pagans. This bad behavior was a big reason God caused the Jews to be taken into exile, and I believe it's part of the purpose. We are still in exile waiting for the coming of Christ. Ezekiel, a contemporary of Daniel, clearly identified this problem in chapter 22, verses 6 through 13. There it is written, 
See how each of the princes of Israel who are in you, God, uses his power to shed blood? In you, they have treated father and mother with contempt. In you, they have oppressed the foreigner and mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and desecrated my Sabbaths. In you are slanderers who are bent on shedding blood. In you are those who eat at the mountain shrines and commit lewd acts. In you are people who accept bribes to shed blood. You take interest and make a profit from the poor. You extort unjust gain from your neighbors. And you have forgotten me, declares the Sovereign Lord. Wow, that is an awesome indictment. To escape this indictment, we must remember the declaration of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, where it's written, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Dear friends, wrote Peter, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The Apostle Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are ambassadors for Christ, as, through, as though God was making an appeal through us. And of course, Jesus said that we are the light of the world, not a light, but the light. We are divinely allowed to live in the world of darkness, to shine the light of hope and grace of Jesus Christ, while in the world, but not of it. Now, it all sounds good, when we preach this, when I preach this. But obviously, it's not always so easy to put into practice. However, we can learn from Daniel about living in a pagan world, which in his day was like America today. Here's how Jesus, light of the world, can shine through us during those prolonged years of exile in environments that are often ungodly and full of darkness. The Apostle Peter said, we must remember we are God's chosen, holy, and special possession. We must draw spiritual lines in the sand of time by rejecting rumors, gossip, and bad news about others. We must abandon our heritage of complaining, carping, and criticizing everything or everyone who are not like us. We must carefully and ethically Choose not only what we put in our mouths, but what we allow into our minds to flow out of our hearts. In order to let Jesus shine, we need to be wise about how we share our faith so we don't come across as self-righteous or arrogant. And as it is written in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. To let Jesus shine, we must practice being polite like Daniel, who was a brilliant rising star in Babylon, but full of wisdom to, enough to be sensitive to the situation of the underdog, such as the guard in his char charge. Listen to how he spoke to them in chapter 1, verses 11 through 16. Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had put in charge of them, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed. 
they were so nice, polite, and cordial that he agreed, even though he knew he would be put to death if it didn't work. He agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine and the, and they were, were to, the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Notice how polite Prince Daniel, the very educated man, was to the lowly guard, and he won that battle, maintained his integrity and identity from the start of his time in Babylon. As God's chosen people, we need to remind ourselves and others who we are, but not arrogantly or by isolating ourselves but thoughtfully, with grace, in order to excel in the environment in which God has placed us in our exile. Church, you, church, the chosen people of God, not just the buildings, should be known for our gracious impact and for what we add to our surrounding community. We should excel in our relationships with people who are lonely, hurting, or troubled, we should bring rays of light into the atmosphere of sporting games, family gatherings, office chatter, and online posts or conversations. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then you will shine among them like stars in the skies as you hold firmly to the word of life. Of course, light will always encounter darkness, but it also always dispels darkness. However, we should not be naive about dangers in the darkness of our current culture. As we preach, teach, and engage our current culture to exert Christ-like influences we need to be wise, recalling that Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, 16, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as the priests in serpent and innocent as doves in a world that is so often ungodly and full of darkness. We must let Jesus shine through us by standing for who we are and excelling in the environment in which we live. In our spiritual exile, we may not face the same challenges as Daniel and his friends, but let's remember that the world is not any friendlier to believers in God now, today, than it was in Daniel's days. So whenever we encounter challenges, we can remember the God of Daniel is with us, just as he was with Daniel. We may not receive the same rewards Daniel did, but we can rejoice that our Lord, our God, will never let us labor alone or in vain. Like Daniel and his friends, the environment in which we live may not be entirely friendly or even wholesome, but as Christians, we should excel by being as healthy as possible, holistically, that is, that means physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and in our relationships with God and others. We should excel in learning from well-rounded and grounded information or opinions that are carefully developed in areas like science and technology, the arts, music, reading, and writing. And if for some reason or other we are not able to excel in these disciplines, we should at least be committed to excellence as effective, supportive, team-spirited workers. In work or business, we should shine light on shady dealings and dark atmospheres, whether we are employers, employees, or bosses. We should excel even in the most menial tasks, and all of us should be known for our service to others in our surrounding community. Because of God's grace, exile always ends in exodus to the promised land. 
Daniel wrote about this in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. The specific prophecy to which Daniel referred was given in Jerusalem sometime prior to the Babylonian invasion and then repeated by way of a letter from Jerusalem to the captives in Babylon. This is recorded in Jeremiah chapter 25 and chapter 29, where it is foretold that the land shall be a desolation and the Jews would serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And then after the 70 years were completed, God would cause them to return to Jerusalem. It must have felt like a dream when that day finally came. After so many years in a foreign land, the exiles could go home. Their release from captivity in Babylon, then part of the Medo-Persian Empire, should not have come as too much of a surprise. After all, it had been prophesied by Jeremiah and predicted in Psalm 126, verses 1 through 6. The exodus of exiles to Judah and the rebuilding of Jerusalem was carried out in three waves, but our exodus will occur in one amazing event when Jesus Christ returns to take us to the place he has lovingly repaired for us to uh, occupy, to live with him permanently. Right now, thinking about this exodus may be hard for some because due to the pandemic and political climate around us, you may be coping with distress like never before. Distress such as fear and worry about your own health and the health of your loved ones. Distress about your financial and food scarcity, unemployment or loss of support services you rely on, that their loss is causing negative changes in your sleep or eating patterns. You may be having difficulty concentrating or focusing on things that are real and true in the swamp swirling with waves of lies. There may be worsening of chronic health problems, worsening of mental health conditions, worsening of climate-related weather destructions, leading to increased use of pills for every pain. Regardless of how many of these cultural cresting or crashing waves we may encounter or experience, today we've gleaned from the story of Daniel and his companions that our exile will also end, but with one marvelous exodus when Jesus comes again. Listen, 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 wrote the Apostle Paul. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. He's coming again. Jesus is coming again. And I'm here to remind you that your exile is about to end in a marvelous exodus because you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Text somebody and tell them, your exodus from exile is on the way. Call somebody after you've heard this message and tell them, it doesn't matter how bad the situation is, your exodus from exile is on the way. Listen, your exodus, my exodus, all of our exodus from exile in this world of sin is on the way because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So listen to this song that says it best for me and for you as a prayer and an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ and thank you for redeeming us with your blood. Amen. Live 
my burdens on the shore I went down a sinner, came up a saint Died with Christ, now I'm reborn Yes, he washed me in his mercy And he cleansed me with his blood Now I stand complete, I have been set free I found life there in the flood Let's sing it out Not the same, I am changed Redeemed by the blood And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. And the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, 
who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. No one. 